Well, amen. If that is your testimony this morning, that you are a sinner saved by grace, would you say amen? Amen and praise the Lord. Let me invite you this morning to take your Bible and find John's Gospel in chapter number 20. John's Gospel, chapter number 20. We are in a teaching series that we're calling Life on Mission. And what we're praying is that this is much more than a a series of sermons, a series of Bible studies, that this would in fact become really a part of who we are, our culture, our DNA at Cottage Hill, that really the membership, you and I as followers and believers of Christ, that we would covenant together, equipped resources, all that we need to each and every day live on mission. And last week we talked about the mission of God, and we learn together in Scripture, we are taught that the mission of God is redeeming and reconciling people to himself. That is the mission of God. God's mission is redeeming and reconciling people to himself. In more simple terms, God is restoring what is broken. And that's his mission. That is the mission of God. And the beautiful thing about that is that he invites, in fact, he expects you and me as followers of Christ to join him in that mission. We are to join God in the mission of redeeming and reconciling people to himself. This morning, I want you and I to to think more practically. What does that look like for you? What does that look like for me? What does that look like for our church as we think about joining God in his mission as we become everyday missionaries, everyday missionaries? And what I want you to understand before we dive into our text is this. Just as I believe God expects you to have a ministry in the church God expects you to have a mission in this world. That's what life on mission, what we're studying together, is about. It's for you to understand, as a Christ follower, you are to have a ministry in the church, and you also to have a mission in the world. Now, your ministry in the church, now it may be that you're in the worship ministry. It may be that you assist us and help us in in the baptismal ministry. It may be in our guest services. It may be in our cafe. It may be in the preschool ministry, the student ministry, the college ministry. But what I believe the expectation of God is, is that you have a ministry in the church. Now, the ministry in the church, your ministry in the church, primarily is about other believers. But not only are you to have a ministry in the church, you're to have a mission in the world. And your mission in the world primarily has to do with those that are not believers yet. And so we're learning together about the mission of God and joining Him in this mission and being an everyday missionary. John chapter 20, would you stand in the honor of the reading of God's holy word? The context is Jesus came to this earth He taught about the kingdom. He came on a mission, primarily to take our place, to take upon himself the sin of all mankind, to suffer, to experience the wrath of God, to die, to suffer death in our place. He also said that he would not stay dead. That because of his sacrifice, that the heavenly Father would raise him from the dead because his sacrifice was sufficient. And that's exactly what happened. Jesus died. But on that early first Easter morning, God raised him back to life. Amen. After that resurrection, he gathered with his disciples. And in John chapter 20, in verse number 21, It says that Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. As I try to do every week, I encourage you to take out a piece of paper, something to write with. If you have maybe write in the margin of your Bible, a note, maybe even taking notes on your phone, there are some things I want to show you this morning. Jesus, after that resurrection, Jesus is about to ascend into heaven. He's giving his, his marching orders. And he says to those disciples, he says to those after the resurrection, he says to them, just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Matter of fact, you may want to underline that statement in your Bible. Just as the Father sent me, I am sending you. I want you to think of it this way. Just as Jesus, when he came to this earth, he came as a missionary from heaven in order to make us missionaries for heaven. So Jesus came as a missionary from heaven in order that he might make you and me a missionary for heaven. What I want you and I to understand is that these words, this command, this commission was not just for those handful of disciples, but it's our marching orders. Jesus is saying, he is expecting you and I to join him in this mission of reconciliation. There was a survey done prior to the pandemic. Thousands of church members were asked this question. What do you believe is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of the church? 89 99% of those thousands of church members, 89, almost 90% of those church members said, the purpose of the church is to meet my and my family's spiritual needs. Now, before I give you the news that breaks my heart, I believe breaks the heart of God, I want to say, you know what? I believe, I believe that one of the purposes of Cottage Hill is to meet your spiritual needs and the spiritual needs of your family. But here's what I want you to listen very carefully to. And this is, what, this is what breaks my heart, I believe, the heart of God. 11%, only 11% of those people that were asked, what is the purpose of the church? Only 11% said the purpose of the church is to reach this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only 11%. See, I believe that probably is pretty accurate. I believe that the vast majority of church members today in America, they believe the purpose of the church is to meet their needs. Because the vast majority of church members in America are consumer Christians. They find the church that will give them and their family what they want. And what they fully do not grasp and what they fully do not understand, I believe the vast majority of church members is that the number one purpose of the church is to reach the lost with the good news of the gospel. We have in our atrium those those large letters, found. There's about 200 light bulbs on those, those letters. Because what we want to keep before ourselves is this truth, is that the number one purpose of this church is to reach those that are lost, that are far from God, that do not know God. They're helpless and they're hopeless. And we help them to be found in Christ. Because the Bible says, in fact, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek that which is lost. And so the purpose of the church The very reason that we are here is to make an impact in this world, to join God in his mission, to join him in his mission. And what I submit to you this morning is this fact. I just am absolutely convinced and I believe with all of my heart and all that is within me that Jesus Christ left heaven came to this earth, he suffered, he bled, he died for the sins of all mankind, and he rose again, not just so that we can gather weekly for a holy huddle, for a holy pep rally, so we can tell each other how wonderful we are. The very reason that Jesus Christ left heaven, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the greatest of the great, to become the lowest of the low, 
The reason he would take upon himself the wrath of God and the sin of all mankind so that the lost would be found. And the very reason, by the way, that when you and I are found, when we come to faith in Christ, the very reason that he doesn't immediately shoot us up into heaven is because there's still work to do. There's work to be done. And that he commands us, he commissions us to be an everyday missionary. I don't want you to be anxious. I don't want you to get nervous when I use that word missionary. The altar call this morning, the invitation this morning is not going to be for you to quit your job, sell all your possessions, pack your bags, and move to India or Thailand or Africa. What I want you to understand about being an everyday missionary is that as you go about your life, whether you're on campus, whether you're at work, whether you're at the restaurant, as you go, as you live your life, You are a missionary. You are on mission, joining God in this pursuit of reconciling people to himself. I believe it ought to be our priority as a church, but as individual followers of Jesus. I believe it ought to be our priority, and I believe it ought to be our passion. I believe that every morning when we get up and we get out of that bed and we put our feet on the floor, we are ready to live a life on mission. Lord, give me opportunity to represent you as an ambassador, pointing people to you and making disciples for your glory. If it is not a passion, if it's not your priority, then I wonder what you absolutely do believe about Jesus about the Bible, about what it says. In fact, before we dive into the text, let me make three statements. And I just want you internally to just check, do you agree with this statement or do you not agree? Statement number one, do you believe Jesus was who he said he was? Do you believe that Jesus was who he said he was? Well, who did he say that he was? He said that he was the Son of God. He said that he was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Do you believe that Jesus was who he said he was? Number two, do you believe that Jesus did what he said he did? Well, what did he do? He took on the sins of all mankind. He suffered. He bled. He died. He took uh, took upon himself the wrath of God. And he rose again the third day. Do you believe that Jesus was who he said he was? And do you believe that he did what he said he did? And statement number three, do you believe that heaven and hell are real places and the only way that you can go to heaven is through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? If you, I, believe, I believe that if you believe in those three statements, then the priority of your life is to help people come into a loving, growing, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Because he was who he said he was, and he did what he said he did, and heaven and hell are real places, and the soul is eternal. So I know you're anxious. Pastor, what are you implying? What are you saying? What are you urging us to do? With all that is in me as your pastor, I'm seeking that, that we would become a church that are seeking to make disciples. A church full of Christians, Christ followers, that are seeking to make disciples. And not that we just celebrate when others lead others to Jesus, but that we are leading people to Jesus. And then after they become a follower and after they're baptized, that that you and me, we are personally discipling someone, helping them grow in their faith. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to make two or three statements to encourage you and help you and take some of the pressure and some of the anxiety off of being an everyday missionary. Number one, 
I can use God's power as an everyday missionary. You need to know that. I can use God's power as an everyday missionary. See, God would never expect, God would never demand you to do anything without first equipping you. What does it say here in this particular passage? John chapter 20, verse number 21 says, he says to that that gathering, he says, look, first of all, peace be with you. But as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Just as I was a missionary from heaven, you are now a missionary for heaven. But then what's the next thing that he says in verse number 22? The Bible says that he breathed on them and said, receive the what? The Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, I am commissioning you. I'm giving you your marching orders. I'm sending you out to join me in this mission of ministry of reconciliation. But I'm also empowering you to do it. I'm giving you the power to do it. Now it's further explained, Jesus says further in Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, just before he ascended into heaven. But Jesus said this, you will receive what? power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So you're to be my missionaries. You are to be my witnesses, but the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and give you the power that you need. The problem with the average follower of Christ is not that they don't have the power. The problem is they don't use the power. And so I want you to write this statement down, maybe in the margin of your Bible or in your notes, but I really want you to get it into your heart, and it is this statement, life on mission is a team effort. Life on mission is a team effort. We have a team, teammate in this work of making disciples, and that teammate is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says this in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and verse number 32, and we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Making disciples is so important to our Heavenly Father, so much so that God not only does He not want us to try to do this alone, but He won't let us do it alone. And so He's given us the person of of the Holy Spirit And so what I believe is this. I believe that if you will believe what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, if you believe what he says about the Holy Spirit, then you will understand that it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter your giftedness, it doesn't matter your personality, but because his Spirit resides in you. And by the way, what that means is everything that Jesus is is inside of you. His power, his wisdom, his joy, his peace, his strength, all that he is is inside of you. And one of the major roles and workings of the Holy Spirit is to empower and prepare people for a witness. So if you will believe what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, then you will believe that whoever you are and whatever your giftedness, you can be used of God to make a difference in the lives of people. And that you can be an everyday missionary. You say, well, pastor, I don't know about, I'm kind of an introvert. This is my giftedness. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is what I'm not comfortable with. Doesn't matter that if you're a Christ follower, you have a spirit within you that gives you everything you need to be an everyday missionary. There's a second thing that I want us to see. Not only I can use God's power to be an everyday missionary, but number two, I can fulfill God's purpose as an everyday missionary. I can fulfill God's purpose for me. One of the questions that I'm asked a lot is, what what is God's purpose for me? Ultimately, this is God's purpose. Pay attention, look up here. Jesus said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. God's number one purpose for you as a Christ follower is to be an everyday missionary. Right before, again, before he ascended into heaven, he gave these instructions. Matthew chapter 28. We also call it the Great Commission. 
By the way, some of these same surveys, some of these same polls, about 54% of church members do not know what the Great Commission is. So if you're here this morning, not, not looking down upon you, helping you understand what you and I are about to read in Matthew chapter 18, 18 through 20, is what's called the Great Commission. It says this, Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 18, and Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Verse number 19, go therefore. By the way, side note, in the Greek, it's as you go. As you go. As you live your life. As you are on the campus. As you're at work. As you go through your daily traffic pattern of life. As you go, make disciples. Underline those two words, make disciples disciples. As you go, make disciples. That is your purpose. That is my purpose as a Christ follower. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Verse number 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Let's walk through that for a moment. Here's the commission. Here's the purpose. Here's your purpose as a Christian, my purpose as a Christian. As we go, we're making disciples. We're to make disciples. Jesus did not say, as you go, join a life group. As you go, serve in the nursery. As you go, sing in a choir, play an instrument, preach and teach. As you go, make what? Disciples. What is a disciple? A student. A student that is learning. So our, our mission as a church and individually is to make disciples. As, to, as I go through the daily traffic pattern of life, as I encounter people, as the Holy Spirit brings people into my life, I am to, first of all, introduce them to Jesus. I am to share the gospel. But then after they become a follower of Christ, as they're new in Christ, as we've been witnessing so many of these in recent months, we're to help them. We're to, what does it say? Teach them. Because he says, make disciples. And as we're making disciples, there's a couple of things. Baptize them and teach them. That's what he says. Baptizing and teaching. Baptizing and teaching. Can I tell you what we're really good at here? Baptizing. Man, we're good at that. Baptized over 150 people last year. Already this year, many, many baptisms. Can I tell you what Cottage Hill is pretty poor at? Making disciples. We're really good at inviting people to church and sharing the gospel and baptizing them. But to make a disciple, you baptize them and then you teach them. So here's what, here's what Jesus expects of me in my life as an everyday missionary. When given the opportunity, I have a gospel, gospel conversation and I introduce people to Jesus. The other part of being an everyday missionary is that when they come to faith in Jesus and are baptized, then I teach them. Because they're disciples. They're to learn. As a matter of fact, a disciple is one who learns and then ultimately becomes the disciple maker. So we are to make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. And you say, well, well, pastor, what is it that we're supposed to teach them? I think we're to teach them four things. I think that we're to teach believers four things. The four fundamentals. Number one, how to experience Jesus in his word. How to experience Jesus in his word. So these these seven or eight people that were baptized this morning, do you know what we need to teach them? How to experience Jesus in his word. We need to teach them how to talk to Jesus. In other words, how to pray. How to talk to Jesus. How to, how to hear from Jesus. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. So we want to teach them how to hear from Jesus. And then number four, we want to teach them how to tell other people about Jesus. So this is what it's going to look like for Cottage Hill. Look up here for a second. Last year, 
Over 150 people came to faith in Jesus and were baptized. But we need help discipling them. Already this year, many people, many people, already over 50 teenagers have come to faith in Jesus and have been baptized. But they need to be discipled. You and I are not fulfilling the great commission unless we are making disciples. Is there someone in your life, is there someone in your life that you are meeting with on a regular basis, teaching them how to experience Jesus in his word, how to talk to Jesus, how to hear from Jesus, how to grow in Jesus, how to, how to share Jesus with other people? Let's say, for example, Ken McGrew here is here on this second row. Let's say that Ken, who is a very mature believer, who, by the way, is actively discipling other people. But let's say that Ken is a fairly new believer. And let's say that every Thursday morning at 6 o'clock, Ken and I meet at uh, Waffle House. And he's a new believer. Here's what I'm not doing. I'm not going over a book with Ken. I'm not trying to impart information to Ken. That's the mistake that many churches and many Christians have tried to do is just simply impart knowledge, impart information. This has to be, disciple-making has to be organic. It's simply helping that person read a book doesn't make them a disciple. They're a disciple, and they're growing in discipleship, and they're able to teach other people. They're, either, they're able to make disciples when they, on their own, can experience Jesus in his word, and they can talk to Jesus, and they can hear from Jesus, and they can share Jesus with other people. And it may take, as I disciple Ken, it may take six weeks. It may take six months. For him to become a disciple maker. How do I know when I have discipled Ken? When he becomes a disciple maker. And he is discipling someone else. So what's the goal? I am to be making disciples that make disciples. That make disciples. That make disciples. So let me tell you what all of this is about. This is about hundreds of people who come to faith in Jesus every year at Cottage Hill who need to be discipled. And you need to be a disciple maker. You say, Pastor, that is a lot, and I'm not really sure I can do that. I don't know how to do that. So here's what's going live. Here's what's going to happen next Sunday as we walk through this in very practical detail. Next Sunday, when you come here, we have a card for you that you just stick in your Bible and it just will walk through some of the things that I'm going to walk through next week in great detail of how to be a disciple maker. We also have at cottagehill.org slash life on mission that will go live next week. We have about six four-minute videos. There's one video in which I talk about the mission, the mission of disciple making. There's another four-minute video in which I talk about the method of disciple-making. And there's four other very three- or four-minute videos that teach this. This is how you teach someone to experience Jesus in his word. This is how you teach someone how to talk to Jesus. This is how you teach someone how to hear from Jesus. And this is how you teach someone how to have a gospel conversation. So we're going to put resources in your hands. We're going to put resources on our website so that at any time along the way, you have everything that you need. Plus, God has given you the Holy Spirit. There's a, um, there's a last thing that I want us to see together. And that is... I can discover God's passion as an everyday missionary. I can discover God's passion as an everyday missionary. And believe it or not, what you and I are looking at now is probably one of the, one of the most important points. Because what determines your passion determines your priorities. In other words, think about this statement. Priorities always determine passion. 
Priorities always determine passion. If a person's priority is making money, then money will be their passion. If that person's priority is golf, then golf will be their passion. If that person's priority is hunting, then hunting has become their passion. But if making disciples and living a life on mission is your priority, then people will be your passion. And what you see in the New Testament is that you see believers, you see those who received the Great Commission and took it seriously. They understood as they made that a priority, it became their passion. It became the passion of the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 20 and verse number 24, he says this, I don't care about my own life. The most important thing is that I complete my mission, the work that the Lord gave me, and that is to tell people the good news about God's grace. Your priorities determine your passion. And when you make your priority being a disciple maker, living on mission, being an everyday missionary, that becomes your passion. It was the passion of Jesus The Bible says this in Matthew, in chapter 9, in verses 36 and 37, it says this about Jesus, that when he saw the crowds, the Bible says in the King James that he was moved with compassion. The Greek is interesting there. It means that literally, inside, physically, he was moved with compassion. He felt sorry for them because they were hurting and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And then he turned and said to his followers, there are many people to harvest, but only a few workers to help harvest them. You see the passion of Jesus, the mission. During during the pre-pandemic, there was that poll about the church, the purpose of the church. Barna has done a recent poll during during the pandemic, thousands of Americans surveyed. Thousands and thousands. This is very interesting. Listen to this. 91% of Americans would say this. They are intensely interested in spiritual things. If there is a good thing that has come out of this pandemic, is that Americans, people, are more intensely interested in spiritual things. And by the way, I believe those two words that that are described in Matthew, I believe that describes Americans today. They are helpless and hopeless. They are hurting and helpless and hopeless. And they need you and I to tell them what they're missing and what they need is Jesus. And when they meet Jesus, when they encounter Jesus, when they trust Jesus, then we teach them how to experience Jesus and how to talk to Jesus and how to hear from Jesus and how to talk to other people about Jesus. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to invite you to be a disciple maker. Is there someone in your life? Is there someone that you work with? Is there a family member? Is there someone that you can disciple? And if you would say, Alan, there is no one in my life that I can disciple. Guess what? I've got about 100 people who need someone to disciple them. Would you be willing? There's a painting that's pretty famous that you probably have seen. It's a painting. It's a depiction of of really of Revelation 3.20. Let's just keep it on the screen for a moment. Revelation 3.20 says, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door and lets me come in, I will fellowship with them and them with me. There's a man by the name of uh, Ken Callahan. He's a Methodist pastor. He's a Methodist uh, consultant with church growth and evangelism. He's at a church one day, and he, as he's looking at the church, he's examining the stained glass window. It is the stained glass representation of that, that painting. It's Jesus standing at the, at the door, Revelation 3.20. Ken says that he had an epiphany. He believes it was the voice of Jesus who said to Ken this, Yes, I stand at the door knocking on the heart's door of unbelievers saying, open the door, let me come in. 
But I also stand at the door of the hearts of believers. And I'm knocking at the door and I'm saying, please, open the door and come out. Come out into the world and tell them about me. Join me in my mission. And so this morning, the invitation, the plea is simple. This month, Jesus is standing at your heart's door and he is knocking and he is saying, please come out and join me in this mission of redeeming and reconciling people to myself. As you go, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. But be a disciple maker as an everyday missionary. Let's bow our heads together for just a moment. I want to pray for us. The band's going to come. They're going to lead us in a song. And as they lead us in the song, it's an opportunity for us to respond to the calling of God. The calling of God for some of you this morning is to begin a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. That's the invitation. The invitation is for you to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. To make your peace with God in trusting Jesus. Turning from your sin, turning from your selfishness, and trusting Jesus. Some of you need to make that decision today. If you're watching via the internet, I want to encourage you right now, if you would, text the number on your screen, 251-225-3150. Text that number. Text the word found. And listen, we will contact you and help you to begin that new journey in faith. This morning in this room, you can text that word found, or here is what I would encourage you to do. Step out in faith from the balcony, from the riser, from the floor, and come to one of our pastors. Our pastors are coming now. They're getting in place. Pastor Neil and Pastor Lonnie and Pastor Ronnie. Pastor Josh is going to be here. Pastor Blake is going to be here. Pastor Jared. Love to pray with you. Love to speak with you. Love to help you come to faith in Jesus. How about this, Christian, Christ follower? Would you, would you say yes? to Jesus today. Yes. Yes, I will begin. I will become a disciple maker. You've empowered me by your spirit. This church has given me the resources. I will be a disciple maker. I will be an everyday missionary. How about this? How about that you have a heavenly home but you don't have a church home? You know what you ought to do today? Today this is a Mobile County wide day today. Is join the church day. You ought to step out and come forward and say to one of these pastors, you know what? I want to join the Cottage Hill family. You come today. Let's be obedient. Let's be missionaries. Stand with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, in these next moments, I pray moms and dads, men and women, young people, college students, high school students, middle school students, preteens, I pray that families would come, unite with Cottage Hill. I pray for these who need to begin the journey of faith. I pray for these who've never been baptized. They've never followed through in that first act of obedience after salvation. That's baptism. And Lord, I pray for the Christ followers in this room that would say, you know what? Lord, I am willing. I say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I will be a disciple maker. I will be an everyday missionary. I will live on mission. Lord, I pray for these that are hurting. I pray for these who have family members and spouses and children that are far from you. We pray for the conviction of your Holy Spirit. We lift up prayers in this next few moments. I pray that the altar would be full. I pray there are those who are coming to faith in Christ, those who need prayer for family members, for those who maybe need a pastor say, Pastor, count on me. I'll live on mission. And I pray it in Jesus' name.